Bob Shear joins us for this special edition of Journalists for Sale. It is the 10th episode of our show. Thank you all for taking on this ride with us so far. Uh, apart from being our awesome boss, Bob is a legend in American journalism and requires almost no introduction. In his nearly 60 years as a journalist, however, Bob has met hundreds of interesting people and influential people from presidents to civil rights activists to even movie stars. But none might be more important in American history than Daniel Ellsberg. The two were close friends. And Bob joins us to discuss his relationship with Ellsberg, the impact he had on journalism and whistleblowing, and how the praise and reverence from the media today contradicts the status quo uh, attitude towards people like Julian Assange and whistleblowers today. Um, so thank you again for, for joining us. Make sure to like, subscribe, comment, all that to fight the algorithm and enjoy. Hey, Bob, thanks for coming on Journals for Sale. How you doing? Uh, I'm not for sale, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to be talking about Daniel Ellsberg today and just about his life his influence, legacy, even though he said he doesn't like that word legacy, but he does have a massive legacy and is a, of a huge importance uh, in American history. Um, just to start off, just can you tell us about maybe the first time, the very first time you met him and kind of what happened, what went, what went on from there and how your relationship evolved? Well, I mean, first of all, I had written, I'd been to Vietnam in, uh, 1964, and I had written a pamphlet how the U.S. got involved in Vietnam for the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions. So I was involved with this issue. I had interviewed uh, at some point uh, Daniel, uh, his future boss, Colonel then General Lansdale, who was one of the people who sort of created this whole mess of Vietnam. Uh, and uh, to the degree that I knew of, of uh, Dan Ellsberg, and he was then at the Rand Corporation, he was something of a hawk supporting the war. And uh, I, I had actually met his future wife, uh, Pat Marks, because uh, she was a radio reporter in New York, and she had interviewed me, and she was critical of the war and so forth. But um, where I got seriously involved in with him was uh, when they were preparing for the trial uh, with the release of the uh, Pentagon Papers and that they were released in 71. But then the um, trial was in 73. And I interviewed him, in fact, at downtown L.A., <laughs> uh, down by the swimming pool where close to where, you know, where I live now. And... Um, interviewed him at the trial, and I was asked by his attorneys to be an expert witness in the trial. Uh, and uh, I was an expert witness on behalf of uh, Lenny Weinglass and Tony Russo, who was his co-defendant. So I did, you know, journalism about the Pentagon Papers. I interviewed him beginning in 71, but our more extensive interview was when he was on going to be on trial. And when they were preparing their defense, very close to where I am now in downtown Los Angeles. And, uh, and then I attended the trial as part of the uh, a witness for the defense team. Uh, so I was involved and I followed it very closely. Hello? Come on, full yeah. disclosure, you guys used to be my students at the Annenberg School of Communication, and in Diego's case, he was on the journalism side, and now you work with me at uh, sure, uh, Post, but uh, you guys have your own shtick now, and you're interviewing me, so what is it you want to know? Yeah, so how did your... Um, so what were your first impressions of Ellsberg? Uh, like, cause, I mean, was he, at the time, the biggest... Uh, I mean, I guess he's, you could still maybe argue that still to some extent uh, the biggest and one of the most consequential whistleblowers in history. But um, what were your impressions of this guy that you had previously thought of as a hawk uh, now blowing the whistle on this uh, this huge revelation? And 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 did your as you got to know him, um, I'm just curious, like what was what was it like to know Ellsberg? Did your relation did your relationship 
change the way you thought of him from the first time you met him? Did uh, you learn anything more as the longer you knew him? And um, how did your uh, first impressions evolve the longer that you're, you had a relationship with Ellsberg? Because I know you two were close. Well, you know, the, the major book written about Vietnam uh, was, was the uh, best and the brightest, David Halberstam, who had covered it for the New York Times. And that title summarized a lot of why it was difficult to get into a debate about it, because the people who supported the war were the architects of the war, considered themselves enlightened uh, foreign policy experts and sort of, and they, most of them were Democrats and considered themselves liberal. Uh, and this was a fight for freedom. We hear that a lot. The U.S. rarely goes to war when we don't claim we're on the side of virtue and freedom, whatever the real purpose is. And Vietnam certainly was that sort of example. And the people who defended the war thought, said it was a necessary war for freedom. You know, as we heard with Iraq and Afghanistan, as we now hear in uh, Ukraine and Russia, that anything we, the U.S., wants to back and support is done in the name of freedom. And when I wrote my pamphlet, it was basically a challenge to that narrative. I had gotten a hold of some information of, uh, basically out of the UC Berkeley Library where I was a graduate student uh, about how the CIA had been involved with uh, creating the GM administration. Now we had- tell, If you can briefly tell the story of how you came across those um, papers. Well, uh, that, that's not critical to the questioning you're asking, if I can. Yeah, you're right. You're uh, right. But, but uh, I, well, Dan, I got to be very close to Daniel Ellsberg over the years. Uh, but what he said was, and at one point, you know, he hadn't read my pamphlet. If he had, <laughs> he would have uh, felt differently about it. But the point is, you could write. I wasn't the only one. There were people, the French, the English, uh, you know, uh, Bernard Fall, uh, I, I think Ellen Hammer was her name, a British person. Plenty of people had covered the French colonial war, and then there was supposed to be the Geneva Accords. Uh, and uh, and, and if, when the war was settled with the French in 54, when the U.S. paid for the French colonial return and uh, paid, you know, at least 80 percent of the cost of that war, but then there were supposed to be elections, free elections, to see about uniting South and uh, North Vietnam and that everybody would participate. And uh, President Eisenhower conceded in his own memoir, Mandate for Change, that 80 percent of the people he expected would have voted for Ho Chi Minh to be the leader of a unified Vietnam. But uh, then the U.S., our CIA, our government on every level, stepped in and said, no, we're not going to have these elections that the Geneva Accords had called for, which was supposed to take place in 1956, uh, because, uh, you know, the other side of the enemy, communist uh, stooges of uh, Soviet Union, of China, uh, we, we totally denied that, you know, Ho Chi Minh had been this great nationalist leader and actually had supported the U.S. during World War II, and his movement had helped find down pilots and so forth. And uh, we developed this uh, fiction that there was a, you know, South Vietnam was an independent uh, country that we were going to protect. And we uh, subverted having the elections. And so when I got involved in the act was, uh, you know, uh, uh, five years after, or six years after. And what you're referring to is, uh, you know, uh, there wasn't had much being written about it. This was all uh, after the elections were supposed to take place. And I did some research at the Berkeley Library, and I found some documents by somebody who had died and his widow had donated the papers there. And I think I was the first person to actually read them. And they were about the development of uh, a, a totalitarian regime in the name of freedom, the No Din Diem regime. And as only base of support were among the 10% of the population of Catholic. You didn't have much support among the Buddhists. And anyway, you somebody found in uh, New York and New Jersey at the Marino Seminary, and we created him as the George Washington of country. The whole thing was a, a fabrication. And, uh, and I went to Vietnam, and I wrote about this 
first based on the documents, then interviewing people and so forth. And uh, and later, Dan would often say, uh, when we spoke together at rallies and so forth, we we became very good friends. He would say if he had read my pamphlet, he would have known that even when he supported the war and went there, that it was based on a fiction. But uh, he, you know, he didn't. And anyway, probably wouldn't have believed it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just getting the facts and being logical doesn't mean you're going to be persuasive. So my pamphlet, you know, influenced some people. I think it sold about a million copies, but it didn't turn the tide. And so for me personally, the release of the Pentagon Papers was a vindication of my own journalism. Uh, I wouldn't say I learned that much from it, but it certainly confirmed uh, what I had had thought, uh, what I had found out. I wasn't the only one. Other people were getting pieces of this by then. And so really the importance of the revelation was that it showed that the government was blatantly lying under Republican, Democrat, and so forth, right? Uh, for Eisenhower and Kennedy and Johnson uh, lying about what this war was all about, how it got started and so forth, and got away with the lying. The media bought it, accepted it, and, and so forth. So the value of the Pentagon Papers was we finally had an official account in their words that they were keeping secret. After all, Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, had commissioned this study. It had been done by a large team, I think 33 uh, Defense Department connected scholars, intellectuals uh, had done it. Daniel Ellsberg was one of them. And the evidence was uh, uh, was quite clear. This was wholly a, a big lie, a tissue of lies, uh, and that we had interfered with a democratic election and put a stooge in power and then created his secret police. We uh, even taught torture through the uh, Michigan State CIA program and so forth. I wrote about that quite a bit. So for me, anyway, the Pentagon Papers was not really a revelation. It was a confirmation of what I had found out, but also other people had found out. As I say, there were no shortage of French and uh, British scholars who had written about this, uh, sometimes quite persuasively. Uh, Philip uh, uh, the Couture, I forget all their names now. Uh, uh, and uh, other people. And uh, so that was the power of it. It was an admission by the government as to its lying. And uh, the, revealing it became the big difference. I mean, then we saw. And by then, uh, you know, it, re- it revealed the lying of Democratic presidents primarily, uh, Lyndon Johnson. By then, Nixon was uh, in office, and Nixon had talked about ending the war, but of course he had escalated it with the bombing of Cambodia and everything. And it was the Nixon administration that went after Ellsberg, and they went after him because they said, this is jeopardizing our free society and so forth. Basically, they were saying, you have to lie to the people uh, to get them to support policies that you think are good, but they wouldn't otherwise support. So that's what... Vietnam was all about. And uh, the interesting parallel right now is the Julian Assange case. And Daniel Ellsberg, who, by the way, most one of the most remarkable human beings that I've ever met, and, uh, you know, one of those people who just, I found, was incapable of lying. I mean, if, if Daniel Ellsberg asked you if you had read a book, you, you shouldn't say, yes, I read it because you skimmed it. I would be... <laughs> You, you better be careful you read it from beginning to end, because then he would say, well, what did you think about chapter 11, where he discusses blah, blah, blah. He was that kind of fastidious, very serious uh, student, always uh, highly educated. You know, I've gone to Cambridge and Harvard before that, you know, obviously uh, w- was very smart, but uh, very disciplined in his thinking and his research. He never speculated about things that he didn't know about. He was always very careful about document to the end. I knew I had many meals with him. I appeared on many panels with him. I interviewed him and did podcasts with him a number of times. And I must say, as a person committed 
<laughs> to fact and logic, he was the high standard. He was it. And, uh, and that's why, you know, when he did this study, he said this war is a tissue of lies. And he wasn't alone. Uh, most of the people by then in the government knew this was all nonsense. This was not some fight for freedom. And one of the fictions, by the way, is that these Vietnamese on the other side, because they were communists, couldn't be nationalists, right? They were subservient to China or Soviet Union. Well, the fact of the matter is, the same guy who escalated the war, Richard Nixon, made the peace with Mao Zedong, had the opening to China. So the absurd, and right now, China's, Vietnam's still a communist country. They're hardly subservient to China. They're fighting with China over some islands and everything. And uh, we all want, we, the U.S. government, wants Apple and to take some of their manufacturing uh, over to Vietnam. They're, they're, they're the good communists. So the whole thing was a fraud from the beginning. And the people who did the study learned something that kind of was already known on the inside. It never should have been believed. It was This was not a foreign ideology taking over a free people. Uh, this was a nationalist movement that had been against the French and now was against the United States. So the whole thing was fraudulent. And it showed the ease with which they're lying. And I want to pay tribute to Ellsberg here because he has been very consistent in his support of whistleblowers, particularly Julian Assange. And I went to a journalism conference where, in fact, our publication uh, was honored the other night, the Los Angeles Press Club. Uh, not many mention of Julian Assange. They're all concerned about, you know, what's happening. Yes, to Ukrainian journalists, you have to be, or what's happening elsewhere. But here's the U.S. government trying to extradite someone who's not even a U.S. citizen for revealing truth, you know, that we, our government, our, our troops killed innocent people in Iraq and uh, lots of lies told about it. Daniel Ellsberg, to the end, defended uh, the whistleblowers, and he was always perplexed by why there were so few. He thought after his example of giving this information to the New York Times and the Washington Post. And to the, nowadays, no one would deny the value of releasing the Pentagon Papers. I mean, some people might, but very few. Uh, and uh, he would always say, look, Julian Assange is in a much stronger position than I was. Danny Ellsberg was in the position of Bradley, now Chelsea Manning. He worked for the government. He had signed the loyalty oaths and all of that stuff. He had access to the data. He wasn't the journalist. Julian Assange is a journalist. And Julian Assange, President Biden, with the cheering of the whole Democratic, let alone Republican Party, wants to extradite him and bring him here and, and, and threaten him in the same espionage act that Daniel Ellsberg was facing 115 years in jail. I think in the case of Julian Assange, they talk about 150 or 170 years or something. It's outrageous. And, uh, you know, and the people who used Ellsberg's material in the Pentagon Papers, the Washington Post, New York Times, which printed big excerpts of the papers, understood this was an act of the free press and had to be defended, and the courts upheld that. Uh, in the case of Julian Assange, he's the publisher. Yes, he gave it to other newspapers like the New York Times, and but they've all said New York Times very clearly, Le Monde, the, the Guardian, they've all, the Spiegel, I believe, I don't know which of the German papers, but they've all said very clearly this was an exercise of the free press. And yet Julian Assange is being persecuted. He's been, uh, you know, put first in, kept in an embassy. If he came out, he would be arrested. Now he's been kept in a maximum security prison in England, then it's going to be done the same here. So the real lesson, the re reason I would like to talk about Ellsberg's example, uh, you know, people generally recognize that the publication of the Pentagon Papers was a necessary act of a free press. Uh, but yet, uh, even though they have officially said that, the New York Times and others, you hear very little uh, from human rights organizations, from Amnesty, from Penn, there are some more from Amnesty, uh, very little from Penn. It was supposed to be a writer's organization. Uh, Human Rights Watch has been a little stronger, but basically uh, you don't hear much about it. Uh, and clearly, as 
Daniel Ellsworth pointed out over and over, Julian Assange, much stronger position than he was. You know, he's not even a U.S. citizen. He didn't take any oath of royalty as, uh, you know, this was information that we have a right to read and learn about. And he's being viciously persecuted. Persecuted and persecuted. Yeah. And before we get... By the way, I'm going to have a sip of my non-alcoholic beer. Uh, I don't want you to draw the wrong <laughs> conclusions, but uh, before we get into Assange and all the other whistleblowers, because we do want to ask about that, um, you mentioned something about all these intelligence officials and all these people in Vietnam and everything were supposed to be enlightened, best and brightest, right? But uh, you know, and I hadn't known about this, but uh, you know, reading Patrick Lawrence's new piece on on Sheer Post now, by the way, um, he talks about how Ellsberg did become enlightened or awakened. Um, He talks about his trip to Japan or when he was in Japan and meeting with um, Gary Snyder and then also, uh, you know, visiting the the War Resisters League and Haverford College and and crying in the bathroom and all these things. And it just shows how much of a conscientious man Ellsberg was. Can you speak to how important that is in having someone like that and having someone who's able to to be self-critical and to be open-minded and especially for these kinds of kinds of things. You know, Ellsberg would be the first person to tell you that he was surprised that there was, have been so few, that he has been surprised at so few whistleblowers. Uh, and yeah, it is true. Ellsberg, you know, went through an eternal struggle. And once he had this information about sharing it and what can you do? He was inspired by people who went to prison resisting the war and what have you. But the real question shouldn't be, and he would be the first to say this, his own heroism. The real question is why, if if hundreds, if not thousands of people had, had already read the Pentagon Papers, which they did, you know, there were a lot of people who had the clearance and access to these papers, uh, Why didn't any of them, other than Ellsberg, reveal them? You know, uh, that is really quite amazing. And uh, the same thing is true of of people who knew about torture. The American government not doing torture, first of all, back then in Vietnam, which is well documented, but obviously in Iraq, Afghanistan, we've had the Senate committee report on torture is still secret. We have access to just the introduction. We know it's devastating, but we haven't been able to read it, uh, that our government systemically tortured people all around the world, something we condemn when, and correctly when others do it. So the real question about the whistleblowers is not why Ellsberg did it or the courage that that he exhibited, but why did the other people who worked on that report, there were 33 scholars who worked on it intimately, uh, you know, now we know one of them, Mort Halpern, who was kind of the director of the thing, did end up supporting Ellsberg and talking about the Pentagon Papers, but they were very few. And uh, it's interesting because I remember I took a walk around Washington with um, Colonel Lansdale, General Lansdale, who was then in Food for Peace in the, in the government. And even he was then saying things about Vietnam that were quite critical. <laughs> but he wasn't saying them on the record. You know, we, uh, uh, I, I was a journalist and he, he was talking about it. But there were plenty of people who knew how shoddy this whole thing was and, and what a tissue of lies it was. But they didn't come out open with it. And if they did, they did it as off the record or something. What Daniel Ellsberg did is what Julian Dodd did. They gave us the record. And therefore, these people of power could not deny it. You know, and and the fact is, lying is the norm for every government in the world, particularly about war and peace, foreign policy. It's always lies, and and you know that famously said, "Truth is the first casualty of war," and it's very difficult for the public to get any information about it, even though the public will pay the price if you have conscription, if you have tax money going, and so forth. It disrupts life; it gets civilians killed and large numbers. We are maybe on the verge of World War 
three and the end of civilization now, but we're being lied to all the time. You can accept that as the norm because the people in government accept it as the norm. They think they have the right to lie, whether they're in the Russian government or the U.S. government or the Chinese government. They think that's their prerogative because why? They are virtuous by definition, so sometimes they have to lie. And what we know about lying is it creates uh, distortions. It gets people killed and it gets you to fight unnecessary wars. And it makes a mockery of any democratic control, any notion of civilian control, whether it was done by the Greeks or the Romans or anybody else. Uh, and, uh, and so that is really the issue here. And we, you know, I've met you guys as students at a, at a major university but the fact of the matter is, what is the sense if we sit around at these universities and talk about foreign policy or how history is made or what are the real issues if we're denied the basic information? We don't know what we're talking about. And that generally is what happens uh, when you're talking about foreign policy. And so it, it sort of mocks the, the very idea of, 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 of democratic restraint with a small d of accountability of representative government is mocked by the claims of national security that justify lying. You know, for, then you're told the opposite of what you told as a kid. Instead of being told the truth will make you stronger, you're told lies will make you stronger. Well, it doesn't apply to a nation any more than it applies to individuals. Lying is a, a, a path of disaster. Yeah, and, and lying is also, I mean, sorry, truth-telling is... In a, in a nation, I guess, where lies are as strong as you're saying and, you know, told as often and, um, you know, without uh, without consequence as often as, as it is, um, truth telling is also destructive, but not for but, but for the person that's doing the truth telling. And, you know, like you said, Ellsberg was facing 115 years in prison. And, you know, for all those reasons um, of the, you know, social and cultural risk that whistleblowing um has and also the fact that it likely doesn't change um you know a lot of the 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 policies that it reveals to be you know um either lies or uh you know attacks on civil liberties or attacks on uh humanity like in the case of the vietnam war um, um and for those reasons ellsberg in his last interview with politico described whistleblowing as something as an irrational act um, so I guess I want to ask you, Bob, do you think that what whistleblowers do is irrational and, and reading, um, or read, I didn't get to read the whole thing yet, but reading, uh, the part of Patrick's story this morning, I guess, informed me a little bit of maybe what was going through Ellsberg's head and doing this quote unquote, irrational act, um, of, uh, knowing that he had this influence from this, uh, uh, Buddhist scholar, um, so is there any value in telling the truth, even when telling it is that is the most irrational it can be when it can put you when it can ruin your entire life and it might not change anything? Well, you won't go to heaven if you lie. Right? I mean, <laughs> I, even our major religions tell us that you will be accountable for your behavior, right? Because there's a higher being that will judge you, uh, that, that, you know, you uh, problem is you're not judged in real time as clearly, but whatever causes you to have a, an ethical code, right? Uh, it can't be just the law because the law, first of all, in many countries is obviously not a good guide. It can support terrible dictators and so forth, but in a society that pretends to be democratic or presumes to be democratic, we we know the law uh, attacks truth speakers. And, you know, that's why we have an Espionage Act. And the Espionage Act was created, right, by an, an enlightened uh, Woodrow Wilson, a Democrat, a man that is revered in many ways, and it was intended to punish. Uh, you know, the name was you're stopping spying and, and so forth in time of war. But the fact is, it was intended and has been used very effectively to uh, prevent the serious critical examination of war, 
uh, or of anything else governments find inconvenient. Uh, so, you know, whether it's the Russian government, the Ukrainian government, the Chinese government, the American government, uh, lying is, is generally uh, the, the, the preferred position, the easiest position. And, and the fact is it creates a great deal of suffering in the world and misinformation uh, and uh, allows you to go along with things that are obviously not only unethical, but are destructive of any other purposes you have as a society, wasteful of resources, get your people killed, cause the death of innocent people, and so forth. So there couldn't be any area where truth would obviously uh, be uh, needed to make sound decisions, humane decisions, and where truth is just sacrificed so casually as in foreign policy and in the preparation for war. Uh, and so, you know, after the fact, when we learn, very often we do learn, uh, we're shocked, you know, that people, you know, large numbers of people were killed over deliberate lying, you know, uh, that's what wars generally reveal, that there were alternatives. I mean, what are we, are we being lied to right now? Is there, is peace possible with Ukraine, or Soviet Union? Uh, what, how did this war get started? We know some, a lot of people profit from it. We know people who have political ambitions can exploit it. But if we're being lied to, uh, as this country of Ukraine and its people are being killed, and now increasing number of Russian conscripts are killed, and we're being lied about how it got started and what the alternatives are and, you know, what are the different interests. Uh, you know, we don't even know who blew up this pipeline, the oil pipeline. You got all of these governments have investigated it. It's not looking at something in outer space, you know. By now, there's got to be quite a bit of information that's being kept from us about how that happened. Uh, but may might not learn about it for 20, 30 years. And the Pentagon Papers, if we want to get back to that, revealed the truth about a number of incidents that drove the narrative in defense of the war. That's what was the power of that. Suddenly you had the record examined objectively by scholars who happened to be working for the Defense Department and the whole justification of the war, that this was an example of international communism challenging the market, was a lie. So I doubt if today any, anybody of any serious consequence intellectually would defend the Vietnam War as somehow being necessary. Well, that's not going to help the 58, 59,000 Americans who died. Uh, and it's not going to help the, what, five, six million Indo-Chinese people who died. McNamara once, rather early in the war, estimated that three and a half million had died, but then it grew. Uh, that's not going to help them or the memory of the family or the people in Vietnam who still suffer from Agent Orange and the deformities and everything connected with it. So there's no accountability. And in, you know, in the case of Vietnam, I mean, the lying was consistent. The whole justification of bombing North Vietnam, the Gulf of Tonkin attack, the second one, which never happened. It's understood now. We didn't learn that for another 20 years. We learned that after the, the Pentagon Papers were revealed. Uh, so, you know, uh, the, the basic thing here is what, what is the content of democracy if in the most important area of activity, the one fraught with the greatest danger, war, <laughs> war, is that basically lying uh, is not only the, the norm, it's defended. That was the shocking thing about what happened with, with Ellsberg. I remember I was there. I was at the trial. There were actually a large number of people. Most of his colleagues at the Rand Corporation, which is, after all, its budget was basically paid for by the U.S. Air Force. But his bosses and his colleagues at the Rand Corporation, with the exception uh, of uh, Tony Russo, his co-defendant, who had turned against the war because he had access to all the secret interrogations of captured uh, Viet Cong prisoners in, you know, in Vietnam, and he saw that torture was being used, and he saw that the whole narrative was distorted about what they were doing and who they were. 
but the colleague Dan Ellsberg's colleagues, almost to a person, certainly on the top leadership, condemned him for releasing the document. They didn't say, "Oh, wow, this is information we should be able." To. Look what's happening with Julian Assange now. Let's bring it right to the present. You know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm at this journalism conference uh, celebration of the free press uh, a couple of nights ago here at the Biltmore Hotel in Los Angeles. No one mentioned Julian Assange. Didn't come up. You know, talk about a free press. Well, what is a free press if it can be lied to about the entire area of foreign policy? And that's what, what is Julian Assange's crime? Is he revealed the truth? No one denies what, what, what supposedly came from uh, Bradley Manning, Chelsea Manning, uh, about killing uh, correspondents, shooting them, shooting innocent civilians, all the stuff that came out. Uh, no one's denying that it's the truth and that it should affect foreign policy. And you shouldn't be doing this and you should examine why it happens. Uh you know, so Julian Assange, he's right now in, in a maximum security prison situation. Joe Biden, President Biden is trying to bring him here. And you go out there today, fellas, go out and find your fellow Democrats, liberals, enlightened people, college graduates. People think they're smart. And ask them, how do you sleep at night? How can you sleep at night when Julian Assange did this incredible public service of showing us what governments do? Uh, what is it? You you don't mind when your government lies? It's just when Putin lies you get upset? You know? what What's going on? Ask people today. Do a little social experiment. Ask yeah, I mean, people Democratic friends. You know, why is this, you know, where's the squad? Where are the enlightened people? Where's Bernie Sanders? Where, what's he saying about this? Is Bernie Sanders uh, okay with Julian Assange being extradited? Has he told Joe Biden this, that he's not Okay. Why isn't he giving some kind of a monologue in the Senate, uh, you know, filibuster about this, you know, the way a few Democratic senators and Wayne Morris was an independent, a few others did that during the Vietnam War. I don't see anybody doing that around Julian Assange. And, and you know, Daniel Ellsberg was very clear. Julian Assange was in a much more defensible position he is. He's not an American citizen. He didn't take a loyalty oath. He is a journalist, a publisher. He's, he was not a, a government uh, member of the military and then of the government. You know, why are, aren't you hearing that? I mean, let's cut to the chase. You know, this is nice. A few thousand people might watch it. But, you know, most people won't. And they don't care. So you got to ask yourself the question, basically, why don't they care? Why didn't your, did any of your professors at the University of Southern California, uh, you know, myself excluded, did that come up much? Do you hear much? No, 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 it's, 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 yeah. it's easier. It's easier, right. To sit in your own ignorance and be um, ignorant to all of these scary realities about like the very fabric of society that you believe in actually being built on lies. Like, I mean, for example, we've talked about this a lot, Bob, but practically no one when I was at USC uh, wanted ever to talk about Ukraine, especially whenever you'd bring up the possibility of nuclear war. Um, people act like you're nuts or like it's, or like, or, they, or they're just, okay, okay, I don't want to talk about it. And, it. and it's just, I mean, you can tell us, right, that we're closer to nuclear war than we've ever been and no one wants to say anything about well, it. Yeah, I mean, you have, yeah. That gets back to Ellsberg, by the way. Don't forget, Ellsberg had worked on nuclear war planning. Ellsberg was one of those really top guys. Uh, this is quite apart from Vietnam, thinking about when you can use these bombs. And so we have lost that whole perspective, at least back then in the 1950s, 60s, there was a conscious you know, awareness that, that that's the end of humanity, that there's no limited nuclear war, that this is very rapidly gets out of control and you can't survive but, it. But and, wasn't there and, also... You know, well, I want wasn't, to make, push a little point here. I don't think on the universities, I don't think in much of the, certainly in the mass media, leaving Ukraine aside, happens to be front and center now with Ukraine and right because Russia is nuclear armed and, and there's a real possibility of, of World War III with, and it will be fought with nuclear war arms. 
uh, you know, uh, it's really quite amazing. There's kind of a giddiness about it now uh, that we don't have to talk about it, you know. Uh, at least Ellsberg, and that to the end of his life, he wrote a, a book quite recently about nuclear war fighting, and he revealed documents, and part of those documents that Ellsberg revealed uh, just a few years ago was how back the, in the day, we had planned to use nuclear war in the 1950s against China over Taiwan. China didn't have nuclear weapons then, and we were going to use them. They revealed that. That didn't even create much of a discussion. So how do you, you know, as young people, do, do you go out and you have drinks and you have conversations, friends, are, are people even aware of the risk of nuclear war? No, you don't. And, and, and it's, yeah, you, and, you're, and, you, and, I, and I know that you're saying that back then that there was this, um, I, they, I, this uh, consensus, I guess, that, um, you know, that if we had nuclear war, it'd be the end of humanity. But there also w wasn't completely right, because, I mean, you had these drills in schools where people would say, oh, go hide under these tables and lock the doors and close the windows if there's a nuclear attack. And wasn't part of that. Uh, I mean, I think the people that were, you know, making these people do these exercises knew, right, that that's not going to do anything if there's a nuclear attack. I don't think hiding under a table is going to prevent you from it dying from a nuclear bomb. So it wasn't part of that, like a psycho, like a psyop in a way, in terms of convincing well, people that a nuclear war could be survived. If you, if you want to go on a bit, let me tell you, the great achievement of, of Dan Ellsberg was not just the Pentagon Papers, but he really challenged uh, this uh, sick orthodoxy of the nuclear war fighters, uh, because you're quite right. There was a whole school of thought. No one denied the danger. But as long as there was U.S. supremacy, which at first, you know, we, we developed the bomb, and everybody forgets we're the only one that killed human beings with these bombs. We, you know, the dropping of the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the killing of hundreds of thousands of totally innocent school children, people going to work in daylight, uh, was shocking, shocking, but as long as we had the only ones, they said, well, but we did the right thing, we shortened the war, we had to do it. Suddenly, uh, the vicious Soviets had it. Oh, now we got to really worry about it. Even so, with the hiding under the desks and everything, the illusion persisted. Two illusions. One, maybe you could survive it if you had a first strike and you took out theirs. And, so, and you had supremacy. That got to be derided. I mean, that, you'd have to be some kind of idiot to think that because you needed so few of them, particularly once you had, you know, the merving of missiles and decoys and everything. And, you know, you, you, you're not going to stop it. And it didn't take that many to end life on the planet. Uh, you had the other idea, this was the madman theory of Richard Nixon. You had to act as if you would use it in order to intimidate the other side, you know, uh, and be prepared to use it so they would be intimidated. Then you had to worry about how did this not get out of control? The Cuban Missile Crisis, of course, is the stellar example of how easily it could get out of control. Well, I think that we're there right now. But the difference is that in the we were close enough to Hiroshima and Nagasaki and that movies about the end of life and so forth. You had people like Linus Pauling and others talking about it. That, uh, you know, even when I interviewed Richard, uh, Ronald Reagan about it, you know, he said, well, you know, you'd have to be a madman to do this. Well, the communists are mad, but we, we wouldn't. But, you know, there was at least a, a sense of impending disaster. Now that seems to be absent. And we talk about humiliating Putin. We talk about, you know, teaching them a lesson. Well, these people, you know, have their whatever, whether it's their fear of being called war criminals or judged as war criminals, whatever it is. The fact is these weapons now are spread around quite a bit. And uh, they're very difficult to take out. Now we have another illusion that maybe 
We can prevent them from coming in. That's nonsense. Now, triage your forces. Uh, you don't have, need that many to get through. So we live in, I think, a, a particularly dangerous moment. And I want to credit Daniel Ellsberg because he didn't stop with the Pentagon Papers. Daniel Ellsberg, his main authority really was as a nuclear war planner. He knew a lot about this whole business, these weapons and what they do and so forth on the highest level. And he wrote, uh, you know, made a major intellectual contribution to showing us how dangerous the situation is. I know I interviewed him about his book. I did podcasts with him. And that's been forgotten. We, we live in the most, I, I think this is the most dangerous, maybe there's a way to wrap this up. I personally think this is the most dangerous time. And one of the few individuals that I've run into and spent time with was Daniel Ellsberg, who knew that. Uh, most people don't seem to be aware. He was sounding the alarm, and that's where he wrote a very powerful message when he learned that, that he was dying from pancreatic cancer, warning about the nuclear danger, which maybe you should reprint when you post this. You know, his, his that last letter was really about, about the, the danger. So, want to wrap this up, guys, or well, you got something more or what? We got a couple more questions, if that's okay. okay. So, yeah. yeah, just expanding more on this idea that, yeah, a lot of our friends, a lot of just people generally don't really care or are, aren't aware of what's going on in the world in terms of foreign policy and how dangerous it is. It's kind of a contradiction because of how much more information we have now, I think, you know, when we have people like Julian Assange and uh, Edward Snowden, all these revelations. But you know, since um, since Julian Assange revealed that information, you know, we stayed in Iraq and Afghanistan for ten more years. There wasn't really that much action. I mean, yeah, we knew about these things, but it it didn't hit, in my opinion, as much as something like the Pentagon Papers did. And I'm curious to hear why. What was that evolution from back in the day to now, where you know someone like Assange gets smeared and and it gets put in this position and and Literally nobody besides, you know, a, a handful of activists and advocates really care. I mean, you have before Barack Obama, I think there was the Espionage Act was used against whistleblowers three times and he used it eight times. And now Trump used it against Assange. So how, how do we get to this point where there was this kind of and maybe and point, please tell me if I'm wrong. There was this evolution. I, I look. I think there's actually, believe it or not, a short answer to this. And, uh, and the short answer is that humility should inform our behavior uh, before anything else. Some sense of our limits to figure things out, whether we're talking about being parents, whether we're talking about being teachers, whether we're talking about policy, running societies, there should be some deep sense uh, that before you take action, you should be aware of the possible uh, unfortunate, bad, dangerous consequence. Any area, whether you're driving a car, you're using a drug, uh, what have you. And uh, I think there's been a persistent warning throughout human history that the major source of, of, of irrationality, dangerous irrationality, is the waging of war, is the wedding of national or tribal or pride to the means of conquest. Uh, that uh, when you have the power to inflict harm, whether through a spear, <laughs> through a nuclear weapon or so forth, when you have the power of a community to raise funds, to have an army, to go out and do things destructively, that this is where most of the dangerous mischief in human history has come from. Uh, this is where the, the tens of millions die. This is where civilizations get wiped out. This, this, the record of, of human civilization is as clear about this, what I've just said, as about anything, anything at all. Okay, 
And uh, our own founders in this country uh, had a wisdom about this. They weren't alone. <laughs> Other people had already experienced uh, the ravages of war or historically the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, or what had happened to Chinese civilization, the Greeks and the Persians, you know, and you go through the whole list uh, uh, that, that war was the great menace and war meaning violence wedded with nationalism, wedded to power, the ability to raise an army, the ability to go engage in conquest, often in the name of freeing people or civilization, but you end up killing the indigenous population here in America, uh, elsewhere. Uh, by the time our constitution was written, our founders for what then they had, serious limitations and failings and some of them were slave owners and we know all that but there was a wisdom to them and i don't know for the life of me how about anybody can teach uh respect for the american system american history without offering respect to the most important uh wisdom of this experiment which is the danger of power unbridled power unchecked power. It's why we have a constitution that separates power. It's why we have a constitution that preserves the right of individuals to challenge power. And that power has to be challenged most effectively in relation to the waging of war. And our founders knew that. They knew that. That's why the president actually wasn't given the power to just go to war. It had to require congressional approval. And they warned continuously while they were crafting this constitution and after about war being the time when you could lie most readily, where you have the incentive to lie, to distort. And they argued that basically you are the choice. Do you want to be a democratic republic or do you want to be an imperial violent power? If you're an imperial violent power, that's what happened when Rome moved from the city-state, uh, you know, accountability to an empire. You can't be a representative government. You can't be a democracy. They got that lesson from the example of England. Most of these people admired England. They were educated by England. And to understand, it wasn't just that they had a king but they had a king that had unbridled power and that power wedded with national ambition, coercion, led them to conquer other people. And when they conquer other people, you know, that included the colonies, but when they conquered other people, there went freedom. There went individual responsibility. There went the Magna Carta and everything. Okay? That was their basic argument. And we, and it's by design, have have lost that message. Why is it by design? Because we have a military industrial complex. War does pay. Jingoism is effective for politicians. Uh, chauvinism is an effective means of controlling people. False consciousness works. It distracts people from their real problems and whether they're being paid adequate wages, whether they have freedom. So we know this mechanism of war is a way of distracting, disorienting, propagandizing people to accept a situation they would otherwise find intolerable. Patriotism is the great danger, you know, is what the founders would have said was fake patriotism. As you know, because I've brought it up in classes, I, I quote George Washington's farewell address, which is very similar to Eisenhower's farewell address. Here are two generals, heroes, war heroes, become president. And George Washington in his farewell address asks his countrymen to beware the impostures of pretended patriotism. Beware the impostures of pretended patriotism. That's what you're getting. We have to fight here. We have to bomb here. We have to torture there to protect ourselves, protect the world. It's the impostures of pretended patriotism. And then Eisenhower gave us a modern, modern motto about it. He said, beware the power of the military-industrial complex because they're going to make money off it. 
and they're going to control the media and they're going to tro- control the conversation and they're going to justify the unjustifiable, the waging of wars. And what, what you have to look at when you judge the quality of our society or any society, to what degree have we heeded that concern? And the reality, you know, the reality is we are the most dangerous imperial power that has ever existed. What, quite apart from our intentions or what we claim uh, we want to do or our stated purpose, because there's never been this much concentration of lethal power in the world as there is in the United States right now. We have the power to destroy the climate. We have the power to destroy life on the planet. Others are gaining that power. I'm not denying that. Other nations can do that. But no one yet has our power to do evil. Let's face it. And we also have a mechanism that allows us to lie about it in a very effective way because we stand for democracy because we are the center of virtue, because of American exceptionalism. Those guys are all monsters. They're evil, they're corrupt, they, you know, uh, irrational. We, we are God's chosen people. We are virtuous, and we have this wonderful system. And yes, there are good restraints built into the system, but they're just routinely ignored. The system is supposed to be designed to prevent lying, to hold government officials accountable, to prevent this, prevent this concentration of power in a military-industrial complex. The fact of the matter is, none of that's working. We lie more effectively in this country than we can anywhere else. Because in most countries, people know their government's going to lie to them. They've been warned. They have, uh, and, uh, you know, there are very few people, I suspect, in Russia, no matter what party they belong to, that are unaware of the possibility that their government is lying to them. I've been in a lot of these countries, okay? I was in China during the Cultural Revolution. I was in Russia under under Gorbachev, and before that under Brezhnev. So I've been in a lot of places. I've been in Egypt, and I've been, uh, I was in Cambodia and Vietnam. I've been in a lot of places. I know of no place in the world where governments lie uh, with greater ease and effectiveness than in the United States. Because it's always, oh no, we have a democratic system. Oh no, the truth will come out, you know? In fact, I just looked at the Pew poll about the election of Democrats and Republicans and how they divide, big poll, on the election, election issues. Foreign policy is not even in the poll of concern. You know, the difference between Democrat and Republican, it's not even in there. Here we are in a situation where the whole world may get blown up, and that's not even an active election issue. You know, uh, inflation is, you know, uh, uh, personal rights, gay rights are an issue, you know, uh, taxes, you know, policing, uh, you know, marijuana policy. But it's really quite startling. Uh, the, the thing that can, I mean, think about it. What would really mess up the climate as quickly as anything would be obviously uh, just war, you know. Already, you have a situation where in Europe and everywhere else, you don't have any peace movement effectively anywhere, anywhere. And everybody's talking about let's rearm, let's get more weapons, let's do more destruction, you know. (laughs) Let's destroy any attempt to have alternatives to fossil fuel. We need more of it. You know, we have to have more tanks out there. And then you have to rebuild all that, which takes energy, hurts the environment, right? And and so we are, what are we? We're drunk on this idea. We're oblivious. We're, we're it, it's totally irrational. And the, the scary thing, and this is what Ellsberg's life was really about. He looked around and he said, hey, I'm a smart guy. I went to Harvard. I went to Cambridge. I was a Harvard fellow. I got my PhD. And everybody I'm talking to, they're all very smart. They all did very well on all of those tests. McNamara had his whiz kids, you know. 
These people are all. So why are we doing this really stupid stuff? Why are we not even looking at the evidence? Why are we lying about it? Why are we taking this dangerous course? You think about that question. We used to have the illusion that the more you studied and the more you read, the smarter you were. Uh, I don't know why we got that illusion, because after all, the Romans were pretty well educated. And the Greeks, they did a lot of bad stuff, you know. Uh, I mean, communism uh, educated a lot of people. So what? They did a lot of bad stuff. Yeah. Isn't it because, um, you know, I, I think that I learned this idea from Gabramate, who you interviewed, but um, I think that drunken, you said, right, that we're drunk on this, that we're addicted to it. And I think that when you're addicted to something that logic and reason and empathy and things like that usually don't prevail over the addiction you have. And it leads you to make stupid decisions, like almost going, like putting uh, your an entire the entire world in a situation where they might be decimated by nuclear war, right? Yeah, it's a drug. It's a drug that makes you feel, get through the day and feel good about what you should not. It's, you know, the inconvenient truth thing. I mean, the fact is, look, come on, we, we three of us are going to get bummed out by this conversation. Other people, if they watch it, they're going to get bummed out. So better to think, no, we got really sharp people in government. They're well-intentioned, you know, and they're doing the right thing, right? I mean, you know, if you look at it objectively, to put your confidence in a Donald Trump or a Joe Biden is insane. And I'm not just talking about their being old or inept or or something. I mean, they've been associated with terrible policies. Joe Biden voted for every war. He justified every lying invasion uh, that I know of. Uh, certainly Donald Trump has done that. And yet the average person in this country, we're putting our confidence in these people doing the right thing and not getting us blown up. Okay, maybe that's a good point to end this. I don't know. Yeah, Um. so... Sorry, <laughs> not yet, if it's okay with you. Um, so Ellsberg issued a very similar warning of, uh, that you're issuing right now about the expansion, expanding, you know, uh, powers overseas and trying to con and conquest and domination in the world and how that affects, um, you know, domestic issues. And he was called, or not called, but he was, it was suggested several times that he was a conspiracy theorist in this political article for uh, believing that. So for the, for, simple for, in their words, um, quote, that he believed that, um, quote, America still runs a covert empire around the world embodied in the U.S. Uh, domination of NATO. Uh, he, Ellsberg, believes Washington de deliberately provoked Vladimir Putin into invading Ukraine by pushing its seat of power eastward towards Russia's borders that the mainstream media is complicit in allowing the government to keep secrets it has no right to withhold, and that any notion that the Americans are ever the good guys abroad has always been false. Um, so I just wanted to ask, you know... You know you by the way, you said that's in political? Yeah. That is so dumb. Think about yeah. Ellsberg. No, but think about Ellsberg. Ellsberg, uh, for most of his life, I mean, he went into the Marines, he, he he volunteered. He was there for three years. He actually carried a gun in Vietnam even when he was out of the Marines. Uh, he was in battle zones uh, when he was going over there for the Pentagon. Uh, he is a person who, uh, through much of his life, believed the opposite of what that political was it that that they that they say. It was uh, he came to more critical views, and not because of uh, any child raising or religious conviction or bi deep bias. He came to his view about the co covert power and its destructiveness by observation, by looking at the evidence, by reading yeah, the and, 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 and let, me just, let me just finish. Evidence that was deliberately kept from the average person. So instead of asking, did, did Ellsberg distort what he found in the Pentagon Papers? Did Ellsberg distort what he learned in the Pentagon or about nuclear war planning? I mean, Ellsberg certainly knows a lot about those 800 American bases. He visited a lot of them. 
so the real challenge here, and he's not alone, by the way. Most people who have studied the Vietnam War, for example, or the nuclear arms race, most people would agree that it's uh, reckless in the extreme, that it's irrational, uh, dangerously so. Uh, the difference is that Ellsberg decided that the American public could discuss this, needed to discuss this. Don't forget the real message here about whistleblowers. You can have, I know, I interviewed Nixon, I interviewed Reagan, I interviewed a lot of people. The first President Bush, you know, I spent 29 years at the LA Times interviewing a lot of powerful people. And elsewhere in my life, I'm sure these people are political, talk to a lot of powerful people. I never found it difficult to have interesting discussions about how dangerous and irrational this world is. The real argument is whether you want to share that information with the average person or whether you should continue to be trusted with power over the dialogue, over the direction. That is the really the basic argument, okay? I had a nice rational discussion with Herman Kahn, who you know, defended uh, nuclear war at one point. You know, I, I, um, I never had a hard time talking to hawks. Uh, I did a whole, I traveled, uh, you know, um, people like that. I mean, I interviewed them at length. The issue is, should they be trusted with the information that is not shared with the rest of the public? Or should the public be in on the debate in an informed way? The promise of the Constitution is that the public is supposed to be the, <laughs> the decider. Okay, what these hotshots at Politico are basically saying and attacking in Ellsberg is not that he got it wrong, because it's pretty hard to argue that he got it wrong. And he certainly was not a, 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 ever an apologist for China or Soviet Union or anybody, a very principled man uh, figuring stuff out, uh, honest to a fault, uh, what they are angry about with any whistleblower, this is true of John Kiriakou, who revealed the torture program, was a CIA operative captured at that point, the highest ranking, was alleged the highest ranking Al-Qaeda person. It's true of all of these whistleblowers, whether they you know worked uh, for the NSA or what have you, most of them came out of the national security establishment, and they believed in it. And then when they saw, wait a minute, the public doesn't know this stuff. And I have been allowed to. And now you're telling me that, that in order to appear sophisticated, I have to keep that information to myself and only discuss it with others. That was the choice he had at the Rand Corporation. They were, in the Rand Corporation, they all were a pretty bunch of you know enlightened, smart people. And they knew that this Vietnam War was a disaster. I interviewed many of them. I was there quite often to their meetings and what have you. That wasn't the issue. The issue is whether you're going to share uh, the dark side of it with the American public. Yeah, and 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 that's actually it, it's funny you mention all this because one of the things that they used to kind of discredit uh, uh, Ellsberg's opinions about Russia Ukraine now is that oh they say they quote some guy saying you know oh I would heavily contrast or maybe not heavily but I would contrast. Uh, what Ellsberg says now with it, what he revealed in the Pentagon Papers because he's, you know, because back then he was an insider. Now he's not basically kind of trying to discredit his opinions now because of where he is now. But but I, I, the, the question I wanted to ask was like these ad hominem attacks used to uh, it, 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 it's a kind of ironic to me that this article that postures as, as a defense of whistleblowers, you have the authors insinuating that the whistleblower that the, the entire entire article is about is a conspiracy theorist, when that is exactly one of the ad hominem attacks used to smear dissidents of the pieties that so many whistleblowers reveal to be farces. So what do you think that this says about the role that the media actually plays, even though right now that they're, they're acting like they're friends of Ellsberg, um, regarding their relationship with whistleblowers in the government? Well, you've answered it by quoting with such an extremely stupid, uh, ill-informed opinion that the, the, then you have to ask yourself the question, how could well-educated people who test well <laughs> and so forth uh, state such an irrational 
viewpoint. I mean, first of all, I mean, if you read Daniel Ellsberg's work, if you listen to his speeches, if you know anything about him, you know the man was all about complexity and exploring that complexity publicly. He never talked down to his audience. He didn't just come up with slogans. Uh, he could be boring to a fault uh, by going into detail. Uh, there, there is nothing in his work that suggested, you know, simplification or sacrifice of complexity. It's just, it's just the big lie. It just means someone never read it. I mean, I read his work because I did podcasts with him. I read his book on nuclear war. Let me tell you that, that, that you know, sometimes it was tough going. Uh, you know, Ellsberg was a guy who began the show by saying, if I said to Ellsberg, oh, yeah, I read that book, he would say, oh, really? Uh, so what do you think about the argument that's in Chapter 12 about so-and-so? Uh, you know, I, every discussion I ever had with Daniel Ellsberg, he played devil's advocate. He looked at things from 25 different directions. It's an absolute slander for anyone to suggest I mean, what conspiracy theory you know, what is a conspiracy theory that the government can lie to you with impunity and get away with it for many decades? Well, that's the story of the Pentagon Papers. That's it. Is that a conspiracy theory? Is that reality? What are we talking about here? You know, uh, but was Daniel Ellsberg suspicious of anything he heard from a, a Soviet leader or a Chinese leader or a Egyptian? No, the same standard, challenging, questioning, looking for data, looking for facts. Uh, I mean, I was with them at conferences in other places and other countries and so forth. It's just, it's just character assassination to suggest that Daniel Ellsberg had any, you know, bl blinders as an intellectual. Quite the opposite. He could drive you crazy by looking at things from a hundred in the, in, in the same conversation. You know, on the other hand, the, why I had a discussion with him about the captain of the Maddox in the, uh, you know, we had a conversation going on for, I think, 30 years about what happened at the Gulf of Tonkin. And every time some new piece of evidence came out, there I was on the phone or in person with Ellsberg. Yeah, but what do you think about it? And what happened at seven o'clock? And what about, the, you know, the report to the uh, your command of this and so forth? I mean, it's, it's, it's just a denial of who this great human being, great intellectual was, you know, I don't want to get too agitated here, but I mean, it's just such a, a vicious caricature, you know, and so obviously erroneous, you know, Dan Ellsberg was your ultimate intellectual, or including in the most tedious sense of, of demanding evidence and re-examining, re-questioning a dinner with Ellsberg, man, you go round and round and round and tear things apart different ways. This guy was not just come up with some flat statement and let it stick. That's just garbage. He would ask to read things. He'd send things. I talked to John Dean about this. John Dean was critical to the Ellsberg case. Might be a good place to, to end on this. Uh, John Dean, who was, you know, Nixon's White House counsel. And, and one reason the case got thrown out was John Dean reveal, you know, what the government had done to Ellsberg and, the, and it was part of revealing about the break-in of the psychiatrist's office and, you know, uh, all this other stuff. And Dean told me he talked to Ellsberg after his diagnosis and they had great respect for each other, great respect. And they had gone over all of the Nixon tapes and what did Nixon really mean by this and really mean by that? And again, uh, John Dean is somebody I have great respect for, uh, you know, as an intellectual, as a thoughtful person, as a whistleblower. And and the two of them and, and Ellsberg bonded with people like John Dean, whether they were Republican, Democrat, whether they were conservative or not, it never impacted him. If they had an interesting point of view, if they had some factual information, he would say, send me the paper. That was his default position. Let me read it. Let me see what that study shows. You know, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's nuts, really. And by the way, you mentioned something before. I was going to ask you to read a, st a study. I don't have it in front of me, but the paper just came out. 
uh, about how, whether Europe is now a vassal of, of the United States uh, because the NATO and what's happening. And what and it makes a very and it's by people who were in the government on a high level. I don't have it in front of me, but it's an interesting study because it says, in fact, now because Europe is so dependent upon the U.S. for security, and the U.S. economy now has grown much faster than Europe was say, in the last uh, fifteen years, uh, that in fact you don't have the pushback that you used to have from Europe over foreign policy and over relation, say, to Russia, even when it was a communist country. And so U.S. dominance, this question of hegemony, which is being challenged by the Chinese, by the Brazilians, by the South Africans, by plenty of people, India, uh, you know, and so forth, Pakistan, uh, is real. And to say that anybody who challenges uh, the dominance of U.S. policy or its con- Destruction uh, is illogical or hates America or is something. I mean, that's screwy. We are an incredibly powerful nation of a magnitude of power that has not existed before. Whether you believe in the country, to what degree you respect its policies, there's just no question about that. That's not a conspiracy, that's a reality. And we can throw our weight around, and we throw it around, a lot of stuff happens. Now, you can defend what happens, or you can oppose it. But to deny the power of the United States at this point in history, and then to hold it accountable for what it does, uh, and then to call that a conspiracy theory, or to say you have a, a bias against America, I, I would, I mean, to, and to apply it to somebody like Ellsberg, who are, joined, you know, joined the military, you know, and, and was an officer and uh, certainly spent his life trying to affect American policy, make it more rational, make it better. I just think that's a uh, slander, absolute slander. Yeah, it, I, I, it was just amazing that in the last interview that Ellsberg gave, they dedicated that much time to assessing whether or not he was a conspiracy theorist, you know, because of precisely what everything you just said but thanks bob for um coming on journalists for sale and talking with us it was a pleasure i think people can find your work right at this website i think it's called sheer post or something <laughs> um <laughs> where you do the sheer intelligence podcast and much else so yeah thank you for talking with let us. Me, let really me add it. a little footnote to that the great thing the, the internet i as you know i say it in my classes is the best and worst of all worlds and, and yes, you can have a lot of bad information floating around and people pretend there's something and they're not or it's artificial intelligence and so forth. But there isn't anything we discussed in this hour and what is it now, almost 20 minutes, 16 minutes, that can't be checked, boom, instantly. You don't have to go, as I did as a kid, to the 42nd Street Library. You don't have to go to some government depository or so forth. You can say, wait a minute, Shear told this, you know, told uh, Max this or Diego, uh, let me look it up. And he can look it up, right? And you can find out, wait a minute, what happened to the the Gulf of Tonkin? Or what did the Pentagon, they can actually read the Pentagon Papers. You know, (laughs) they can actually read Ellsberg's book. And and generally, without even buying things, you know, you probably can find some copy of it somewhere. You can find you know, well, you can watch my podcast with him, but you can also read this article in Politico, which you're saying they suggest that he had a conspiracy. So, you know, the whole point of doing this is not to end discussion, all right? Not to say, yeah, we heard three people and they made a lot of sense, so that's, well, no, that's the beginning of discussion. That's the beginning. And people should check it out, you know, check it out. Get your bullshit detector on, you know, see if it's true. And, you know, and if it's not true, where'd they go wrong? And then what's to get to a, a deeper understanding? You know, yeah. that, that'd be my sermon. You know, nobody should just accept, you know, because it's being said in an effective way. So what? As I pointed out, uh, we are a danger because we're the most effective liars, our government. <laughs> 
you know, uh, people who are not effective liars are less dangerous. People can see through them, you know. But when you really master the art of persuasion and PR and propaganda, uh, you know, you, you can do a lot of uh, dangerous stuff. Yeah, I think that's a good note to end on. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you, Bob. Yeah. Appreciate it.